Earlier this month, I had the chance to visit my home away from home, the Orkney Islands, and I took the opportunity to walk as much of the coastline that surrounds Scapa Flow as I could. At roughly 120 square miles in area, Scapa Flow is one of the most important bodies of water in British history, and one of the largest, greatest natural harbours found anywhere in the world. Surrounded on all sides by Orkney's southern islands, it has long played an important role as a safe anchorage in British and European naval history. It would be the Vikings that would name Scapa Flow, and they prized it for the ability to shelter their long ships and fleets before or after the arduous journeys to Scandinavia or down the coasts of the British Isles. Hundreds of years later, and just prior to World War I, the British Admiralty realised that Scapa Flow would be the perfect location to base the Royal Navy's home fleet, seeing the potential naval threat that the growing German Kriegsmarine based in the Baltic Sea posed. Ironically though, in late November 1918, following the end of World War I and as part of the Treaty of Versailles, it would be this powerful German high fleet that would end up here in Scapa Flow, as over 70 battleships and destroyers confiscated by the British were interred over on the western side of the flow around the island of Hoy. In a famous act of defiance, however, the German crews, frustrated and demoralised, intentionally sunk almost the entire fleet at anchor on the 21st of June 1919, sending hundreds of thousands of tonnes of steel and machinery to the shallow, sandy floor of Scapa Flow. What followed this grand and disastrous scuttling was one of the most incredible salvage operations in history. Between the two world wars, almost the entire fleet was painstakingly refloated, salvaged and scrapped using a number of different experimental methods. For some of the largest battleships, workers actually dived into the ships themselves, sealing them in from the inside, draining the water out of them and then just letting them pop back up onto the surface on their own. There are photos of the ships being towed away for scrapping fully watertight, covered with the crews and work huts as they sail through the North Sea, except still fully capsized. A very bizarre sight indeed. Despite the massive salvage operation, there are still numerous remains of these German wrecks in the flow that were never recovered, and many have gone on to become world famous dive sites, but also an important source of materials in modern times. Most of the fancy stuff is now perhaps gone, but the steel itself, despite being rusted and corroded from over a century under the salt water, has also been protected from something, something that affects almost all modern steels produced since the end of World War II, radiation. Since the first nuclear test, the Trinity test in 1945, over 2,000 nuclear explosions have been detonated around the world. The resulting radioactive fallout is everywhere, and while it is relatively mild for scientific equipment, for example Geiger counters that are sensitive to small amounts of radiation, modern steel making processes that use oxygen to convert iron to steel have been tainted due to the background radiation in the air and the atmosphere itself, imbuing all modern steel with small amounts of radiation. Therefore, there is a significant demand on everything from medical equipment to spacecraft for pre-war metals that have been untouched by our reckless nuclear testing and shipwrecks can provide a valuable source for that metal. Some of the German wrecks in Scapa Flow, therefore, have been in recent years carefully re-salvaged for small quantities of this valuable metal. This is where, however, the value of this metal and the potential for profits through salvage has become a problem. In July of last year, it was announced that two Dutch submarines had disappeared. Both had sunk in December 1941 off the coast of Malaysia after having been struck by Japanese naval mines. Now, the location of the wrecks had been known about for some time, but after a team of surveyors visited the wrecks in 2019, they found both had completely vanished, leaving behind only a few scraps of metal and indentations in the sand. In 2016, a team of international divers undertook a survey of another Dutch wreck, this time being a Java-class cruiser, one of two sunk during the Battle of the Java Sea. She had only been discovered in 2001, but upon reaching the murky depth where she would be located, they instead found nothing. This six and a half thousand ton cruiser had gone. It didn't end there, however. The team discovered that the USS Perch, a 300 foot long submarine, 
had disappeared. The one and a half thousand ton destroyer, the HMS Encounter, the eight and a half thousand ton cruiser, the HMS Exeter, had both vanished. The nine thousand ton USS Houston was still there, but it had been ripped apart by explosives and salvaging equipment. Many of these ships had only been discovered in the past 20 years, and all of them are now gone forever. The list, unfortunately, goes on and on. An amazing Guardian report from 2017 found that up to 40 Second World War era vessels had already been partially or completely destroyed in the seas around Indonesia, Singapore and Malaysia. Dredgers and salvage vessels have been sighted off these wrecks, pulling up hundreds of tons of steel and materials for salvage. It's not just the low background steel salvagers are looking for either. Copper cables, phosphor bronze propellers, even the raw materials themselves. Thousands of tons of steel can be valuable, low radiation or not. The thing that angers so many people about these ships is that unlike the German ships here at Scapa Flow, they are not simply empty hulks rusting on the seabed. They are also protected war graves. While what's left of the now twice salvaged German fleet mainly surrounds Hoi and its nearby islands to the west, now an internationally recognised tourist spot for divers, another more recent wreck lies closer to the east side of Scapa Flow, just near the pier at Scapa Beach. This is the wreck of the HMS Royal Oak, a 30,000 tonne Revenge class battleship, originally built in 1916. The HMS Royal Oak was a huge ship. As one of five super dreadnoughts that made up her class, she was over 620 feet long, plated with thousands of tons of thick metal armour and armed with four twin 15-inch main guns and crewed by over 900 men. By the start of World War II, she was relatively outdated, but still a formidable warship an asset to the Royal Navy. On the 13th of October 1939, only a few months into the Second World War, the HMS Royal Oak, along with several other ships, including the newly completed HMS Belfast, were tied up here in Scapa Flow, the supposed safe haven of the Royal Navy. Since the start of the century, Scapa Flow had been turned into a fortress, with all the approaches guarded by hundreds of gun turrets, lookout posts, airstrips, as well as submarine nets and blockade ships that restricted access to some of the eastern approaches of Scapa Flow. The British thought Thought they were safe, and on the night of the 13th, hundreds of crews lay sleeping in their bunks on the Royal Oak and other ships at anchor in the Sound. What neither the crews nor the lookout spotted, however, was an incredible feat of skill and daring that was taking place right under their noses. U-47, a German Type 7 submarine, had managed to sneak into the flow, her captain painstakingly threading his way past a myriad of anti-submarine nets, blockade ships, gun batteries, and lookout posts that covered the approaches in. Expertly threading the Kirk Sound between the islands of Lamholm and mainland Orkney, U-47 managed to break into the Sound, where a bounty of unsuspecting ships lay in wait. They soon spotted the massive silhouette of the Royal Oak, and U-47 fired three torpedoes, two of which missed and one of which hit the Royal Oak's bow. While shaken by the hit, there was some confusion on board and many of the crew didn't quite understand whether they were even under attack and many returned back to their hammocks. Twelve minutes later, however, three more torpedoes struck amidships, causing catastrophic damage to the Royal Oak. Cordite from the ship's magazines ignited a huge fireball that raced through the ship's internal spaces. The battleship quickly listed to starboard, where water flooded in through her portholes. Crews who had survived the blast now found themselves stuck deep in the bowels of a rapidly sinking ship. As the walls turned to floors and the vast Royal Oak quickly rolled over. The 30,000 ton battleship was underwater by 1.29 a.m., not even half an hour after having been struck by the first torpedo. Of her complement of 1,234 men, 835 died, including 134 trainee boys, all under the age of 18. The loss of an outdated ship like the Royal Oak had little effect on the Royal Navy's ability to wage war, but it was a huge hit to the morale for both the public and the Navy, and the loss of so many so close to home in a supposed safe harbour like Scapa Flow had a significant psychological impact. It would also forever change the nature of Scapa Flow, as the eastern approaches, including the one which U-47 had managed to expertly sneak through, were permanently blocked by the creation of the Churchill barriers to ensure that such an attack could never happen again. 
Like many wartime wrecks which sunk with huge losses like this, the Royal Oak is now a designated war grave. The wreck and the remains of the bodies which lie inside her are safeguarded by the Protection of Military Remains Act 1986. And authorised divers are absolutely prohibited from approaching the wreck. And each year, Royal Navy divers commemorate the loss of the Royal Oak by diving on the wreck and placing a white ensign on her stern. Most bodies were never recovered. And much like the wreck of the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbour, oil slicks will still emanate from the fuel supplies trapped inside her hull. The Royal Oak was never salvaged and it will lie forever now on the seabed as a war grave to commemorate the loss of all those men and children who were on board. This is the stark difference between many of these shipwrecks being illegally salvaged and something like the German fleet in Scapa Flow. It's thought that the hulls of those now missing illegally salvaged wrecks in the Java Sea may have contained the bodies of over 4,500 crewmen. Reports from local salvage yards have told of bullets, clothing scraps, even human remains being discovered while wrecks and salvage materials were being cut up and scrapped back on land. In the Indonesian port of Brondong, it's suspected a nearby cemetery contains a mass grave with the remains of thousands of bones and other fragments that have been found during salvaging in these local yards. Thousands of ships sunk during World War II and they took with them hundreds of thousands of men. And while it would be easy to get outraged seeing a war grave being churned up by a digger, it's sometimes hard for us to conceptualise the idea of a war grave as a ship being removed from the bottom of the seabed. Unfortunately, so long as these materials are in demand, so long as there is not a significant police presence to keep an eye on these wrecks, it's probably going to continue to happen. And all we can hope is that sites like this remain as protected as they are and hope that around the world similar sites will soon get the similar level of protection. Anyway, just a short video I thought I'd make while I was up here in Orkney. Uh, I had hoped to record this outside but uh, it's not really the weather for it but uh, I'm gonna get back on the road. So thank you very much for watching and uh, yeah, I'll see you later. Bye-bye.